Yes, my master. Of course, of course, I would never think about calling you that. But I'm sure the others need to know as well. Surely you would allow me to speak with them on your behalf. Oh, I, I understand, sir. Please, please, show mercy on me. I will never use that terrible nomenclature, the mind The mind I shall only use your real name, the Illithid. <laughs> G'day, guys! How we doing? Uh, my name is Michael and I am the Dead Aussie Gamer, here to share with you my tips, tricks, strategies and ideas for playing and running tabletop role-playing games. Today, we're going to be doing a monster spotlight on uh, a very, very, very iconic Dungeons and Dragons monster called the Illithid, or as they're more commonly known, the Mind Flayer. Now, Mind Flayers are a fantastic villain. I, I think they're easily my favourite type of villain. Um, they play great tyrants, strategists, and of course masterminds to any kind of campaign. Their abilities to dominate the minds of the weak and enslave those around them into the mind thrall make them the perfect kind of villain to be performing acts of evil from behind the scenes while your players slowly unco uncover what appears to be a larger, more sinister plot. Now, this video is not going to just be a monster information type thing. We're going to be looking primarily at uh, how you can use Illithids in your campaign, and of course, a few tips and tricks for how to portray them to your players as you perform the role of a Mind Flayer. So, first and foremost, what is a Mind Flayer, uh, if you've never heard of it before? Well, uh, a Mind Flayer uh, is one of these creatures. I, I love this, by the way. This is, this is like one of my favorite purchases of all times. Um, a Mind Flayer is a humanoid, well, often a humanoid creature that looks not too dissimilar to this, um, that has the ability of, uh, of s to basically psychically bombard their victims, uh, either dominating them and forcing them to bend to their will, or even just concussively damaging their mind and causing them to collapse under the sheer weight of their psychic strength. They are given the term Mind Flayers because of their ability to devour the brains of their victims. And their taste and hunger for the knowledge tapped within is unparalleled. The great thing about Mind Flayers is that despite being predominantly, well, what I'd say is more of a, a weedy type villain, there are three major aspects to them that can turn them from your standard spellcaster, batty, smart, intelligent, noble kind of person into a more complex, versatile, and downright terrifying villain. Number one, they have the ability to share a hive mind. This means that they do not function solo very often. If they do, it is a rarity more than anything else. But more often than not, they will function in a colony as little as three illithids working in tandem in order to achieve some sort of larger goal. There they are interconnected by an elder brain that sits in a pool of psychic goo. They then use this uh, exchange of knowledge, this hive mind that they possess, in order to not only expand their own machinations, but to also be able to raise and grow the next generation to be even more smarter, even, oh, sorry, even more smarter, <laughs> even more intelligent, even more sinister, and even more cunning than the previous generation. So that being said, um, Illithids are highly, highly prized for their, um, their ability to understand the world based on the knowledge of several thousands of other illithids. The next terrifying thing about these creatures is, of course, their abilities to extend the reach of their influence beyond the immediate vicinity. Many people believe that illithids are terrifying because they can just control you. As soon as you approach them, bam, suddenly they have your mind and you are fighting your allies and woe is you. The true terror of this power comes in the form of not realizing who your friends and foes actually are. An entire town of people may have thousands of sleeping agents who already have fallen to the guise and whims of an illithid in the nearby vicinity, and one would never know. 
Well, unless, of course, you follow the old rules of uh, Illithids and you had the Void Mind, which were a type of race that had a hole in their head and they had this kind of brain ooze type thing that, yeah, you could recognize those guys. But, but we don't talk about them. Uh, anyway, yes, so... The, uh, the fact that they could hide in plain sight through the actions of their slaves and their, their mind thralls made them incredibly versatile. They weren't just bound to the Underdark for where they, from whence they came, but they had, they had players everywhere, and that was this truly scary thing. The third and most frightening thing, at least in my mind, is their ability to, well, mature, as it were. Illithids actually are, begin life as these tiny little tadpoles. Uh, once the tadpoles hatch, they are kept in an elder brain tank where they are basically fed uh, brains by, you know, people who take care of the pools and stuff like that. And eventually they go, undergo a process called seromorphosis in which the illithid tadpole is introduced into a humanoid brain. This brain is then consumed, and the flesh and body of that person, of that individual, is then corrupted, changed, shift, and turned into an aberrant creature, uh, exactly like this one. Now, many people think that, oh, well, that just means humans, or orcs, or dwarves, or whoever they happen to come across, and that, that's perfectly fine. However, there have been known cases in which uh, seromorphosis has occurred in a non-humanoid creature. One such creature was, in fact, a beholder. So for those of you who have not seen a beholder before, that, ladies and gentlemen, let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger. There we go. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a beholder. These creatures are a very iconic uh, monster in, in, in Dungeons & Dragons. They have the ability to shoot lasers out of their many eyes. They float around as these dungeon guardians with mouths full of teeth and an anti-magic eyeball ray. Um... These creatures have been known to be corrupted by uh, the Illithids uh, and, of course, creating the Mind Witness, which is this nightmare fuel right here. Not only uh, still possessing the eyeball stalks and powers of a Beholder, but also the brain-sucking psychic energy and hive-minded knowingness of a full-blown Illithid. Now... Take in that knowledge for a moment. Think of your most terrifying villain that's not an illithid. And think about the fact that you can then give him psychic powers, hive-minded instincts, an age span of about 195 years old, and the ability to control a army of mind thralls. These creatures expand, they grow, and they are sinister and devious and... and oh, they they're beautiful, and I love them. Uh, okay, so that's that's what these guys are. These guys are incredibly awesome. How do we use them in our campaigns? What do we do in order to play these mind flayers, these illithids, in your game? Well, I think for the most part, as you lay down the plans for any plot or any adventure, if you want to use the mind flayer, it has to be something that is done at the start, right? Uh, I mean, you can introduce them midway through your adventure, but I think they really thrive the deeper, the more ingrained, the deeper into the plot the Mind Flayer happens to be. Um, I'll give you an example. I had, a, um, I had an adventure in which I was playing a sorcerer, wizard type so uh, character. His basic goal was to uh, try and bring about a zombie apocalypse because his daughter had died and he wanted to raise his daughter back to life, but he needed so much energy that he would um, basically raise her daughter, raise his daughter, but she would be killed in the process. So in order to bleed out a lot of the excess energy from this process, um, he would then need to resurrect the, this entire village. The problem was, is he was missing lots of parts, there was things happening here and there, and of course, the town people thought he was mad and decided that they were going to go stop him. Um, needless to say, the adventuring party found out about this, and rather than lynching this poor, grieving man, they thought, hey, let's go talk to him, let's go find out what's going on and see if we can help fix it. 
So they went and they, you know, fought off a couple of baddies, you know, here and there. There was some, you know, Eagle kind of characters, and that was kind of cool. It was a very Victor Frankenstein-y kind of castle. Uh, there were a couple of haunts from their, the failed experiments and all that. And, of course, the occasional undead that had, like, the uh, servos and light bulbs and Tesla coils. Eventually, they confronted the um, the sorcerer and managed to talk him down from his, his evil ways, which, you know, was kind of different. I was honestly expecting a giant fight with a Frankenstein six-year-old, but sure, whatever, players being players. Nonetheless, what they found very interesting was a journal that this, this man had, which I had actually written down, and I'd, uh, I'd actually bound it in a, in a nice little case thing. It was really cool, and it was actually a gift to one of my players. Um... And it basically outlined the blueprints for um, for building this machine. The catch was, is that next to them were the annotations of how to interpret the journal, which was written by the guy they just caught. So the first thing they said was, um, where did you get this journal? And he said, I, I, well, I wrote it. And they said, well, no, you didn't, because you've, you've written your annotations here, and they're in different handwriting. And he went, oh, well, you're right. I don't remember, you know, I, I, I remember I was at the funeral for my for my daughter and then in my grief, a, a traveler offered me offered me a book and I could have sworn that I was just writing in that book. And that's how I came up with a blueprint. And lo and behold, they then had that plot twist. They, they then found out that there was something more to this story and they went and they found out that there, that there was this actual cursed item seller who um, was actually working for a mind flayer and they found him and he had holes drilled into his head uh, and as they sort of tried to spoke to him this evil voice sort of spro spoke through this cursed uh, item merchant uh, basically telling the players exactly where what what was going on and where they needed to go which eventually turned into this big chase but you know i digress that is where an illithid fits in an illithid isn't like a giant where you walk up to something and just start clobbering it with something big. An illithid isn't even your kind of lich who is on his own and kind of, you know, uh, doing his own thing in his castle, right? An illithid is a network. It's a, it's a, it's a people. It's, it's a group, an organization, a colony, a hive, as it were, <laughs> that functions in order to pose a very tangible threat to your players. Um... I mean, I've even done stuff where an entire town was slaved to uh, to a trio of illithid, and they didn't let anyone in on it. Like they were just a really friendly, happy town. Everyone was going about their business until the PC started asking the wrong questions, and then a uh, serial killer appeared out of nowhere, and they found out the serial killer was actually uh, a red herring, as it were. And they went back to the town, and there was another serial killer, and l eventually they figured out that something was super wrong and tracked it down. But you know, yeah. This is how illithids play out. They are the monsters behind the scenes. They are the uh, Wizard of Oz behind the green curtain, as it were. All right. So now that we know a little bit about Mind Flayers, how do we go about playing them? Now, Mind Flayers, first of all, um, are telepathic. So speaking can kind of be very uh, tricky. Obviously, you could try speaking as an illithid, especially when you are dealing with uh, players who have come prepared with anti-telepathy or anti-psychic magics. And you can start talking like this, in which your tongue doesn't actually stay still within your mouth. If you speak like this, it's kind of gross, but at the end of the day, this is why they are psychic and speak with their minds. Okay, to do that, and I'm not going to show you because it's gross. Um, what I normally do is, uh, with the voice acting thing, if, if you guys haven't checked it out, I did a, uh, one of my first videos, I think, was on voice acting. There are three places that you, you come up with a voice from. Your mouth, your throat, uh, sorry, four. Your diaphragm and your stomach. This one is all mouth, right? So as you're forcing uh, words through your mouth by not necessarily using your... Your, your throat, you end up with a very round sound. It's, it's very weird. All of the uh, vibrations seem to come here. You don't feel any vibrations from your diaphragm. You don't feel any vibrations from your stomach. Uh, it's very hard to speak like this all the time. Yeah, okay, cut me some slack. This is where we're going. Now the next bit is really tricky. 
you got to get your tongue really wet, right? Like you can't you can't do it in a dry tongue, right? So uh, and then what you need to do is you need to sort of lick the back of your teeth and the inside of your cheeks as you attempt to sound out the words. So as you're speaking, you end up creating these small pockets of air that rotates around in the inside of your mouth. At least that's how I imagine this speaks, okay? Now understand, look, look at this. Do you see this, right? That is the noise that this is making. As you can see, when you speak like this, it's easy to understand why we use our telepathic powers. Stop wearing mind blocking rings. Oh god. Okay. Stay. And you stay too. There we go. Okay, so. Fun times, if you want to really try and portray them that way. Um, good news is, obviously, yeah, if they've got mind-blocking rings and stuff like that, then you've got a way to communicate. Bad news is when you start talking like that, obviously you kind of create a certain persona. When you want to play an illithid, I always feel like you want to make sure that everything they do is super deliberate. Every word you say, every uh, thought that crosses their mind, they do not... Um and ah, like I do. <laughs> if you've watched my videos, you know I um and ah a lot. So th everything they say has a purpose. Take your time. Deep breath. Slow down your manner of speaking. Try to imagine like Jeremy Irons or, or Frollo from, from Hunchback of Notre Dame. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a great, great movie. And then try to round it out so that uh, it just creates this this beautiful, um, very elegant way of speaking, but it's more inquisitive as opposed to um, assertive, right? Let me give you an example. So, you've entered my domain. I must say, I find your presence here. Curious, to say the least. Tell me, when you were at Sterngard and you found those tiny little trinkets that I had left for you, why did you not simply take your ill-gotten gains and go and live a quiet, simple life instead of returning here where your doom awaits you? Little things like that, taking those moments, those pauses, instead of saying um or uh or ah, uh, um, make those characters feel more confident. The slow pace is one that creates that sense of curiosity and, and, and um, you know, sort of opens you up to being that intelligent, even if you're not. Uh, I'm not, like I said. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, things like that. If you try to speak with a really fast voice and you're not quite sure what you're saying, this creates a sense of uncertainty or hesitation or, or speed, and, and you don't really want to be doing this, and then and, 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 and you end up repeating yourself over and over and over again, and it, you sound like you don't know what you're talking about, like I do. Okay, so yeah. That's, that's, that's how I'd play the elephants. It's, it's slow, curious, and very deliberate. Now, this being said, obviously being a psychic creature, you don't necessarily need to follow those colloquialisms. It can change based on who is listening. Uh, if you are talking to a group of elves, they could sound very elven, and you could bring a little element to that simply by having a more breathy voice as you try to communicate to these simple, simple folk. Or, alternatively, you could take the same attitude with the dwarf. I am speaking to you within your mind. The voice you hear is not my own, but just one you'll find suits your needs, makes you feel welcome and more at peace, pliable to my will and dominion. All of these kind of accents work with the illithid, as long as you have those slow, deliberate, and curious notes about your voice. Alright guys, so, 
thank you very much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, again, this is the first one I've tried of these. Did you like it? If you did, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Let us know what monsters you'd like me to do a, a spotlight for. Uh, would you like me to... Uh, do a monologue in a with the monster's voice. Would you like me to do some more monstrous creatures and make growling noises? I mean, yeah, let me know in the comments and I'll I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, and of course, uh, do follow us on Facebook because I will be putting out a uh, announcement soon about the schedule for 2019, um, which is going to include a whole bunch of things, including like you know YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, blah 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 all that. Uh, if you want to, then head on over to our uh, Discord channel and come chat with me directly. Uh, it's just a really cool place to hang out if you love RPGs and you, you know, kind of want to just spitball or soundboard any of your ideas. Uh, the link will be in the description below as well. And of course, if you want to support us in 2019 and you want to help us really grow and expand the channel, then head on over to our Patreon page. For as little as a dollar a month, you can be one of our cheeky goblins that help us keep this engine chugging forward. And if you want to join us, at, well, me, at a, uh, a um, pay-to-play game, as it were, uh, I have a $40 Patreon where uh, you can just jump in straight away and, uh, yeah, play a little game with me. Currently, we are playing the Price of Greed uh, trilogy, which is a Pathfinder game. Uh, a fun, fantastic game. Um, we are currently, I think, in book two, The Mask of the Living God. Uh, so, yeah, so join us there. And, of course, guys, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Until next time, make sure that you game hard or die trying.